It is a pleasure to be here today to speak about adaptation policy, and I thank NCAR for the opportunity. It is also very pleasing to see so many people here today. I'm mindful that you are about to go into several days discussion, sharing research and experience and adaptation. I propose this morning provide a policymaker's perspective, which I hope complements your other discussions. The government's climate change policy framework has three pillars, mitigation, adaptation and international engagement. That said, you would be forgiven for thinking that almost all the attention is paid to the first and third of these pillars, with insufficient regard being paid to the adaptation pillar. Conferences like this one are an important opportunity to rebalance our attention. There is no question that rebalancing is needed. Any reasonable reading of the science indicates that collectively the world faces a very significant adaptation challenge. Even if the world were able to stabilise greenhouse gases at 450 parts per million of carbon dioxide equivalent, we would still risk warming above pre-industrial levels of 2 degrees Celsius. There are many estimates of the pathway we are currently on, but most estimates indicate that we are tracking significantly above 450 parts per million with associated implications for likely temperature increases. Therefore, under any realistic scenario, adaptation will be required. This does not mean that we should scale back efforts to enhance mitigation action, because it's not a binary choice between adaptation and mitigation. The more we manage to achieve on the mitigation front, then the less is required of adaptation. Today, I intend to provide a personal reflection on adaptation policy. My reflection is drawn from my experience having worked on a number of areas of policy, ranging from tax policy, competition policy, welfare reform, debt management, and of course, climate change policy. Indeed, a theme that I will discuss is that adaptation policy is very similar to other areas of policy. In adaptation policy, we need to apply a standard policy toolkit. In doing so, we must ensure that we bring the full toolkit with all the subtleties that that entails to ensure we land at robust outcomes. What do I mean by the standard toolkit? Well, first I think the toolkit must start with understanding the objective that we are trying to achieve. I believe that around 80% of the analytical task of policy advising involves specifying the objective correctly. Now, that 80%, I suspect, is untestable, so I hope the scientists in the room uh, don't hold me to account on that. It's a personal reflection. Um, but the art of policy advising is to define the objective broadly enough to ensure that you do not inadvertently rule out options, but narrowly enough to ensure that the objective is operationally meaningful. I believe that the overriding objective of policy to is improve well-being. This objective is captured in the vision statement of my department. Our vision states that our objective is to improve Australia's well-being by contributing to effective global and national responses to climate change, including the necessary transformation of the Australian economy. I understand that many people find that framing the objective of policy as improving well-being is impossibly broad for the purposes of policy analysis. I have some sympathy for this point of view, but I also believe that much bad policy advice that I have seen stems from advisers taking too narrow a definition of the objective. In particular, bad policy often starts with an objective that ignores matters that are very important to the people affected by a policy. Many years ago, I was actually uh, giving training courses on how to do regulatory impact statements and I went to a regulatory agency uh, and I won't name the agency uh, but I asked them what their objective was and they replied to me uh, their objective was to regulate the industry. Um, it struck me that wasn't a very useful guide to uh, what, what might be done. I said well like, surely that can't be your objective, maybe it's to promote the industry, maybe it's to provide information to consumers, maybe it's another objective, promote health. And then they argued among themselves for about 45 minutes as to what their objective was. Um, it seems that that was a corporate planning exercise that perhaps could have happened a little earlier in the process. Um, it's very important to take into account the factors that, affect the, that are important to the people affected. A little over a decade ago, I was involved in an exercise in the Australian Treasury to define wellbeing for the purposes of policy advising within Treasury. Uh, Treasury has recently revised this work and modified the framework, illustrating there is no one right answer to this question. That said, I still find the former frame for, framework useful when considering policy matters. The framework identified five elements that contributed to wellbeing. 
These were consumption possibilities, distribution, risk, complexity and opportunity and freedom. In retrospect, the label of consumption possibilities did not resonate out well with a broad audience. We intended to capture the idea that the level of sustainable consumption that was possible without running down stocks of assets was important to well-being, and we always intended the term to cover both non-market and market issues. History shows that few interpreted the term this way. Strategic policy starts with the objective, well-being, and then considers the drivers that will affect well-being. The term drivers was fashionable at one time in the management literature. I confess to not knowing if it's fashionable now. But it refers to the key external factors we must respond to that will influence outcomes. In many respects, a lot of the work done by people in this room is trying to articulate what the drivers will be that is going to affect the well-being of the community. So how does this all relate to adaptation policy? Well, the key driver for adaptation policy is that we are facing a non-stationary climate. This non-stationarity includes changes in the trend and variability of climate outcomes. The key question for adaptation policy is whether our current institutions and policies are consistent with promoting well-being in the presence of a changing climate. The real work is then to apply our standard but sophisticated toolkit to this question. With respect to this question, I believe that it is highly likely that policy settings could be improved with benefits for well-being. In other words, I believe there are significant barriers to adaptation. This is precisely the issue that the Productivity Commission has been looking into in its current inquiry. The Commission has made a very useful contribution to the debate with its draft report. The report applies a standard policy toolkit to assess whether there are barriers to adaptation. Overall, the Commission is more sanguine about barriers to adaptation than I am. I believe this is largely relates to two different, although contestable, judgments. These relate to acceptance of climate science and to the use of a real options approach. I suspect that in this room, the idea that the starting point for adaptation policy is that the climate is changing and that this is large part due to human activity is not controversial. In contrast, I suspect that a significant barrier to adaptation in the community is that the science of climate change is often not accepted by relevant decision makers. If climate change is not accepted, then it is hardly surprising that policies and institutions are not designed to deal with the changing climate. Lack of acceptance can take different forms. It can take the form of not accepting estimates of global change in the climate, or it can take the form of not accepting information or estimates of the local impacts of changes in the climate. I believe the Commission's draft report implies there is broad acceptance of the science associated with global changes in the climate, but considerable uncertainty with respect to local impacts, leading to appropriate caution among policymakers about taking preemptive measures. On balance, I am less confident about the acceptance of the science in the community and would argue that there are some areas that we have better information and certainty about local impacts than implied in the Commission's draft report. The question of the acceptance of the science is in principle an empirical matter, albeit one that can be hard to measure in practice. I would not claim that this is a scientific way of coming at the question, um, but I would wait one personal observation. In recent years, I've tried to seek out opportunities to engage in policy discussions with groups of people where climate change is not their day job. In these gatherings, climate change rarely comes up in conversation, and when individuals consider long-term scenarios, climate change considerations, either with respect to mitigation or adaptation, are often implicitly absent from the scenarios. I'm not saying that the people considering these scenarios are ill-informed. Often, if asked directly about climate change, they will provide a considered response. But in practice, the implications of climate science are not internalised in their forward-looking considerations. So I would argue that acceptance of the science is not widespread, either due to outright rejection or because while not rejected, it is not sufficiently internalised by key decision makers to practically influence decision making. With respect to local impacts, there are a number of areas where we have reasonable information. Of course, these are not point estimates with no variability, but we do have information that should guide decision making. 
For example, if you were to start thinking about building new port facilities today, you might be pretty confident that sea levels will rise by at least 50 centimetres during the design life, life of those facilities. I would like now to turn to real options analysis, which is central to the PC's report. The idea of keeping options open wherever possible is sound. However, I think we must ensure that we understand what options are genuinely left open when we make a decision. The Commission's draft report discusses the cost-benefit analysis of adaptation reform. Its methodology looks at the net present value of investing in adaptation today, involving a cost up front and avoided damage over time. It then compares this against delaying adaptation action by one year. A key question is whether any damage function stays the same whether we act early or not. My contention is that we need to take account of path dependency. Path dependency is also a significant feature of mitigation policy. There are many long-lived assets in the economy. A decision not to invest in a particular form of capital and invest in another type of capital tends to mean there are significant legacy effects which have an impact on the emissions profile for a long period of time. Uh, Jean made reference to this example earlier. A good example of this is investing in a large coal-fired power station. With an asset life of 30 to 40 years, the existence of that asset, even if you move to a new climate regime, affects the cost of electricity and the likely competitiveness of renewable sources of power for a long period of time. There is a clear path dependency. In my view, there are two types of path dependency. Technical path dependency and political path dependency. Technical path dependency is similar to the example of the power station. The technical endowment of the capital stock affects the options available to investors. Technical path dependency is important, but possibly just as important is political path dependency. Political path dependency recognises that once a government has made a decision, or in some cases has chosen not to make a decision, it can be very hard to reverse that position. Once rights or implicit rights are allocated, it is typically very difficult for governments to alter the rules for allocation for those rights. In adaptation policy, political path dependence is pervasive. To be clear, I'm not saying this is because the political system necessarily gets it wrong in terms of promoting well-being. There are many things that look technically possible which may be very hard for a government to enact in practice. This is because in practice, some of the elements of well-being are affected by a change in policy in a way that is resisted by those affected by the policy and their resistance has resonance within the wider community. An example worth considering is raised in the Commission's draft report. The draft report considers the case of a resident who applies to build a house on a block of land next to a beach. The local government, based on a state government planning benchmark, considers the property will be adversely affected by sea level rise by 2100. As a result, the council might choose to deny planning permission. This would have benefits of avoiding future damage, but it would also carry costs, as the resident would miss out on benefits from living in the property for the years before the damage occurs, and the council would miss out on rate revenue. The Commission comments that the real options approach would encourage the party to look for a low cost option that would enable the resident to take advantage of present conditions while responding to information that becomes available in the future. One way to do this would be for the council to permit development on the land, but with an option to built into the planning permission. This option would give the council the right to impose restrictions on the use of the land once certain trigger points, such as an agreed sea level rise, were reached. When I reflect on this example, the question I ask is, what would a government's capacity to make such a change or exercise such an option be after a resident has enjoyed use of the property for 50 or so years? From a wellbeing perspective, the proposed assignment of rights may seem entirely appropriate from a consumption possibility point of view because it leads to significant consumption benefits over time. But that is unlikely to be the whole story. From a distributional perspective, which has numerous dimensions, including standard income distribution, but is also, also spatial, intergenerational and transitional dimensions of distribution, 
It would be interesting to see whether the exercise of the option by the council would be seen as appropriate by the community. Similarly, with respect to the risk, you could argue that the resident was fully informed and therefore vol voluntarily assumed the risk associated with the planning regime. However, it is not clear to me that this assignment of risk to the landholder is likely to be durable, potentially resulting in the broader community bearing risk. Further, purchasing an asset with a contingent use value and a contingent right to enjoy is complex. Would the community accept this complexity in the first place and how in practice would it be dealt with over time? It is useful to have such a concrete example to explore real options analysis. My suspicion is that political path dependency means that it would be very hard for a government to exercise such an option. This judgment reflects the reality of strong and widespread community support for transitional measures when questions of distribution, complexity and the risk borne by the community are taken into account. This support is particularly strong where there are concerns about how fully informed and capable individuals or businesses were when they made key decisions. Political path dependency is real and should be into taken into account in analysis of adaptation. I would like to sum up, my, uh, sum up what my remarks have been trying to get at today. Uh, first, adaptation policy has been a somewhat neglected pillar in the three pillars of climate change. Uh, perhaps not neglected in this room, uh, I'm making a broader observation. It's an incredibly important pillar because any reasonable reading of the science means we will need to take, the, take significant adaptation action. In thinking about adaptation policy, we should apply a standard but sophisticated policy toolkit. We should consider all elements of well-being. We should consider the driver, in this case the non-stationary climate that impacts on well-being, and we should determine the policies and institutions that improve well-being in the context of that non-stationary climate. The Productivity Commission has made a very useful contribution to the debate with their draft report. I think there are two main areas that warrant substantial discussion prior to their final report. First is the extent to which the non-stationary climate is accepted within the broader community and the actual degree of uncertainty about local impacts. Second, while real options analysis is an interesting approach, I think we must be acutely aware of the path dependency associated with decisions we take. In this respect, we need to think about both technical and political path dependency. Putting this together, my view is that we collectively need to devote substantial resources to systematically analysing and dealing with barriers to adaptation. In particular, I think we should focus on areas where path dependency is pervasive. In many respects, this is analogous to applying the precautionary principle, where there are irreversible effects, the ultimate form of path dependency. So with those comments, I think it's wonderful to see such a great collection of people working together on a wide range of adaptation matters, from researchers to policymakers to practitioners. I look forward to the discussion in the rest of the day. Thank you.